Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for session two of the Price Fundamentals of Sound workshop. My name is Dean Lees, and I'm a member of the marketing and engineering team here at Buckley Associates. Uh, before I hand things over to Mauricio today, uh, who is our presenter from Price, to go over uh, acoustic analysis and uh, the selection software from Price, I'd just like to say a few things here. Uh, what you'll see today is, uh, again, session two. So we had a session yesterday as well. If you didn't get to join in on that, I, I do highly suggest that you join us tomorrow at noon. A lot of what we talked about yesterday kind of lays the foundation and gives a good base for what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, so again, if you if you weren't able to join us yesterday, uh, I do recommend that you sign up for tomorrow's session at noon. Um, we uh, we are offering this session as well as uh, session one on uh, on tomorrow and then Friday for session two. So if you also have some team members or or anyone that you feel could benefit from this type of training, please feel free to forward those links to them. Uh, all those links are still active and you can you can still register for for those courses that we're offering on uh, on Thursday and Friday of this week at noon. Um, this program again is something that Buckley has worked closely with Price on. Uh, you know, fun, the fundamentals of sound and, and understanding sound and, and how to deal with uh, HVAC systems that might be uh, objectively loud is uh, is a very um, very good topic in our market. It's very relevant, and you know we're seeing that based on how many people we have registered for these sessions. We had over 250 people register for this, and we're very happy that you're able to join us here today. And, uh, and that there's been such a good response to these sessions. We had a lot of great questions yesterday. I hope that continues today. Uh, none of this would really be possible without you, our clients, and a, and a commitment from you that you're going to get a great educational experience from Buckley and from Price and that we're going to offer something that's relevant in our market and, uh, and that's you know, something that's needed and, and something that engineers are going to get a lot of knowledge out of. So again, I thank you for being here. And if any questions do come up, there are a lot of people on the line today. Uh, use the chat function, use the question feature. We do have panelists on the line here today from uh, both Buckley and from Price who are going to be able to answer those questions. Um, if you know, we'll take some time uh, during the presentation or after the presentation to address those questions, uh, or we'll we'll type an answer to you within that chat function. So either way, if you do have a question, please ask it. I mean, at the end of the day, we're really here to do this for you. We want you to get something out of it. We want you to get the most that you possibly can out of it. And uh, if you have a question, it, it's a great time to, to kind of get that question answered, anything relative to sound really. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll hand things over to Mauricio and let him get started. Thank you, Dean. Great introduction. Hello, everyone. Welcome to day number two on this noise control presentations on HVAC acoustic fundamentals and the silencer selection software and acoustic analysis demo. I'm just turning on the camera to introduce myself for the next slides. And as I mentioned, my name is Mauricio Salinas. I started working at Price right out of university, uh, right into GRD HVAC acoustics. I am the application engineering manager for noise control. So in many cases, what that means is I get a call when sound is a problem already. Um, I'm hoping that after all this training, I get that phone call to be involved with and work with you guys at the design stage so that uh, we can avoid any noise complaints. I specialize in 
silencers, acoustical panels, and any package solution, uh, including quieter curves, uh, enclosures for equipment, for example. I'm also heavily involved in business and product development, and you have my contact info below uh, in case you need to, to call me for uh, you know, either sizing a silencer, coming up with a cool solution, you name it. To, to kick things off, the agenda for today is going to be looking at the software, doing a little bit of a demo on silencer selections. We're going to summarize what we, what we learned. I have a few slides kind of giving you some screenshots of what we went through on the software, because I imagine you're going to need that whenever you want to revisit uh, the silencer selection demo. If you download the software and want to do a silencer selection, you might need a refresher. So I'm going to have some slides there for your reference. And then the last section of this webinar today is going to consist of a demo on acoustical analysis software. So in front of you, you have a slide where, uh, with the link for you to download the software. Uh, it is available for engineers. It is free and it is the most up-to-date um, software with performance, submittals, anything that you might need to put a product as basis of design for a job, you can find in the software. So here is the link. I just wanted to share this with you in case you decide to explore and download the software. And this is what we would use to do an acoustic analysis, for example, or any silencer selections. In front of you, you're going to see the interface. The first kind of screenshot of the presentation shows you that you could do more than silencer selections. That is terminals, grills, registers, diffusers, fan and blower coils. For today's presentation, we're going to focus mainly on noise control products and acoustic analysis. And those are the icons we're going to go to uh, and look at today. Okay, in order to do a silencer selection, there are three main search types for you to do so. And that is by performance. So you have a silencer schedule and you are trying to meet that, either a silencer schedule by price, by any other manufacturer. By design criteria, what that means is now that you know what are design, the, the, the three main type uh, ways to describe sound pressure, remember from Chris's presentation yesterday, so that would be NC, RC, or DBA. Now you have a design criteria to meet, and you could do selections by that in the software. And or if you if you already know what you want, you use price industry silencers often, and you want to quickly go and get a selection that way, you could type the model and you could search a silencer that way as well. Making silencer selections by performance, as I mentioned before, it basically means you, someone already did an analysis, most likely an acoustician, came up with the sizes that you see on the left-hand side, came up with the model, the airflows, and these silencers might be going into supply and return ductwork for rooftop units. Uh, you can tell that when, when you see a supply or return tagging in some of the nodes. And you have a pressure drop requirement, you have airflow, so you go to the software and quickly look at that and make a quick selection. So selection by performance, someone did the analysis, you already know what you need, you're going to go and search it and get it from a manufacturer such as Price. All right, so let's quickly do some examples on that. When you open the software, you're going to see that you have a bunch of options. In this case, we're going to focus on noise control silencer selections. In front of you, you see how it looks. You're going to click on that. And the first thing you're going to see is that the software is specifically tailored to look and for you to enter data the way any silencer schedule is laid out. What that is, is you're going to search by performance, as I said, by design criteria, or by price model. To start with performance, you already know what you need. You might know whether or not you need an absorptive silencer. I think uh, you all know what that is, right? Uh, anyone give me a happy face if you have used uh, a an absorptive silencer. So with fiberglass insulation, with natural fiber, 
uh, high temperature insulation, you done a selection that way, you're looking at an absorptive silencer. A film line silencer, on the other hand, has a plastic cover, a film that will encapsulate the media to offer protection against erosion or if the if there is moisture in the air, uh, you want to wrap that silencer or if it's going to be outdoors and it's going to be exposed to the element, you might want to protect the insulation so that over time it doesn't sag and lose some of the properties. In general, if you have a silencer with fiberglass, mineral wool, or natural fiber and it gets wet, as long as it's allowed to dry off, it's going to perform. Um, we just don't recommend, recommend silencers being submerged underwater for a long time, then that might be a problem. So that's a film line silencer, right? You have a certain requirement to keep the air clean. Uh, this could be a checkup room in a hospital, even an operation room. Uh, ASHRAE does let you use silencers with a polymer film encapsulating the acoustical media as long as you have a MERV 13 filter upstream to kind of clean out the air for the just in case there are particles from the silencer, for example. And then we have the reactive or packless silencers as well. So that is for exhaust lab applications, kitchen exhaust, um, you know, any critical room where the air needs to be free of contaminants and or you have any sort of chemicals going through, you're gonna use a packless silencer. So you have that right away in the software. You could also choose your geometry, rectangular silencer, elbow silencer, circular silencer, and you have two main options of silencer casing. So the standard one or an extended casing one. And I'm gonna explain what that is as I go through the demo. So when you're doing a silencer selection, as we already mentioned in the beginning of, of these slides, you already have a schedule and you have a tag, in this case, let's say we're looking at SL1 from the slides I was showing. It's going to be a 24 by 24 silencer, 86 inches long. It's gonna have, um, let's say, air velocity of 16, 25 feet per minute, 1,625. It's for the supply, so that means it is a forward flow. So you will have two different flows there and they have an effect on performance, have that in mind. So forward means that the sound is traveling in the same direction as the airflow. In this case, a supply. Does that make sense? So far, so good? All right, I can see your faces, but I assume everybody's following up. Thank you for that. If it is a reverse flow, obviously, such as a return application, then the sound from the fan ductborne traveling to the ductwork is going in the opposite direction as the airflow. So that would be a reverse flow. In this specific example, we're looking at a supply with forward flow. A typical maximum pressure drop, if you don't have many details, is a quarter of an inch. In this case, they are asking for a maximum of ideal pressure drop of a tenth of an inch. And it has a certain amount of performance that we need to do. All right, so this performance that you see, as Chris explained on yesterday's presentation, that is insertion loss. That is the arithmetic, not logarithmic, the arithmetic deduction you're gonna take out per octave band from the fan supplying air into the system. So you input that pretty quickly. I'm gonna show you how you can do a, tons of silencer selections in no time. And on the right hand side, so this is the performance that you need. If it was a competitor model, for example, you could go and try to match it based on the main competitors that we have, other manufacturers such as IAC, BAW, uh, Kinetics, Vibroacoustics, you could do that too and try to match an equivalent model for that, right? On the right hand side, you're gonna have your construction requirements. So do you need media protection? 16, 25 feet per minute, the fiberglass inside the baffles of the silencer are protecting the media from being directly exposed. So most likely you won't have any erosion of the media. If this was, let's say 2,500, uh, 2,500 feet per minute, the software is already gonna tell you, consider using fiberglass cloth liner to prevent any sort of erosion of the media. So the software will tell you that depending on your phase velocity. 
Okay, so we had just over 1,500 feet per minute forward flow. Uh, right now, the schedule calls for ideal conditions. If you recall from yesterday presentation, when you do the test for performance for silencers, you have five equivalent duct diameters of unobstructed ductwork that's not transitioning at the inlet of the silencer. And then you have 10 equivalent duct diameters at the outlet um, from the silencer to the reverberation room. You typically have that much room in any job that you size, five and 10 equivalent duct diameters. The answer is no, you probably don't. So you might have to account for system effects. If this silencer is a side discharge from the curb supporting the rooftop unit, for example, you might have an inlet condition of fan and an outlet condition of potential. If it's a rectangular straight, you might have an elbow with veins turning the air down into the space. All right, so now it's not ideal. A more reasonable pressure drop might be a quarter of an inch or even more. It depends how much the fan has left available to push some uh, air through the system. And then you have the gauge. If this silencer is outside and there is no residential buildings or commercial bu buildings close to the rooftop unit, then 22 gauge might be acceptable. When would you need a thicker gauge? If you had those silencers exposed close to an occupied space, why? Think about conservation of energy. You have inlet, you have a certain amount of sound going in, you have some that gets absorbed, but also some that break out through the casing as it passes through the silencer, right? So sometimes if you are pushing a lot of air at high air velocities, you, can, you could be generating noise and that noise could be escaping through the casing. If you have a critical space close to the silencer, such as a library, a window of a library close by, you might wanna change this to 16 gauge. And you can check what gauge you need once you use the software, the acoustic analysis software that is. All right, so let's say there is no critical spaces close by. Um, you might wanna add flanges to, uh, to attach to you know, the flex duct going through the fan. And the outlet connection might be on a slip and drive, for example. And you want it to be a low leakage and protect from the element. So you're gonna fill all the seams with duct sealant, typical duct sealant, and then you're gonna click search. So when you look at that now, you find a silencer. The software is going to tell you the relative price as well. So if you wanna have a little bit of a cushion and factor of safety on performance, you could select a higher performing silencer, but it's gonna come at a 50% price increase. So the cool thing is about the software is that it's gonna tell you the relative price from the cheapest option, always gonna give you the cheapest option first, unless you don't have a choice based on performance, and then you're gonna see a factor. <clears throat> now, if you look at the screen in front of you, you're gonna wonder, okay, what are all those numbers? What is this price model over here? What does RH86-6A mean? If you scroll to the information icon, you can see what that means in a specific for price silencers. So in this case, it's an RH. So it's a rectangular high velocity silencer with a 60 inch, 60 inches of length with a module factor of six, which means it's a range of 23 to 24 inches on the width dimension. And then the PA code. The PA code goes from A all the way to G. And A is the largest free area, so less pressure drop. If you look at that for the same model, when you go to B and C, your pressure drop is going up. That is because we're closing the gap as uh, we add more insulation and make the internal baffles thicker. Does that make sense? So in this case, the first option that meets the requirements is the silencer RH866A. And the other thing I wanna mention is, what if you don't remember how to read performance, and you get some results that have all of a sudden different coloring, different color coding, you could also scroll there to see what it means. So the numbers in black 
uh, when it's when they appear in black in front of you, that means that you're meeting or exceeding the performance. If it's bolded, it means that you're exceeding it by a bunch. If it's blue, it means you're slightly shorter. But typically, the standard allows you to have a 3 dB range plus minus to uh, consider it acceptable in the in the industry. So if all of a sudden you get a selection from Buckley and it's one or two decibels short on one of the octave bands, I wouldn't panic. If you recall what Chris mentioned yesterday, the human ear can only sense a change of three decibels in sound spectrum. And if it's not the driving octave band, it might not even be an issue. However, if that's the case, you could select a different silencer that tries to and, and hopefully meets all the performance that you need. Now, installed pressure drop. You are also now that that you're looking at the screen in front of you, you added conditions, inlet and outlet conditions, system effects to the silencer. When you don't, the selections are going to give you performance based on the ideal conditions, so five and ten equivalent node diameters, inlet and outlet of empty ductwork. And when you add system effects as per ASHRAE chapter 48, table, table 27, with, from experimental values, you can see you can add those factors and see that the actual pressure drop they are going to see in the space with this silencer is over a tenth of an inch. And as an engineer, I would like to know that uh, and know what I'm going to expect out of the silencer because my fan might not have enough static left to push. You know, a silencer that's creating almost uh, half an inch of pressure drop, for example. All right. So we select that silencer, you could click on it, add it to your schedule, and you'd made your first silencer selection, right? If you were to do that same unit, but you want to have a polymer film liner and wrap around that, you're going to see that for the exact same model, which it was an RH6A, you have a change in performance, right? In that specific case, it shows you that you need to go to a D now and close the gap because a hard surface between the acoustical media and the perforated metal, if you if you think about that, it's going to make the silencer not be so absorptive anymore. So whenever you see a schedule or or you grab a silencer of the catalog and you grab a regular absorptive silencer performance, but then add a note that says must have polymer film liner, then that doesn't really apply anymore because it's going to have different performance. Okay, I just wanted to mention that. And the polymer film silencer is equivalent to what you might hear as Mylar or Tedlar. Mylar and Tedlar is just a brand name. Uh, the polymer film liner, uh, the polymer film line silencer from Price is equivalent to that. And then you have different. Uh, types of media, right? If you want to use natural fiber, for example, because the spec calls for no fiberglass in the airstream. And uh, unfortunately, you have to go from uh, an RHT86A, which have much less pressure drop, to a 6D if this was the requirement. All right, so, so far so good. Are you guys following? Do you think this is useful? Please leave a comment in the chat. I I really like hearing back from you guys. And so so I just went over silencer selections by performance. You have a schedule. Someone did an analysis. It's easily laid out for you, and you could either uh, select a price silencer or an equivalent from a different manufacturer, equivalent to price silencers as well. All right. The second way to select silencers is by design criteria. And in this case, it might be at the design stage, such as this example. You might have a green heck fan. In this case, it's an array of fans, quantity of two, a two by two array. Uh, the overall dimensions are 89 and a half inch by 89 and a half inch width by height. And the engineer came to me and said, hey, Mauricio, I am bringing air into a power plant with nine gensets. Uh, I'm going to use these fans to bring air in from each side of the building for each generator. 
and I need a silencer that brings the sound power that you see in front of you of 92 dBA single rating to, I, I need it back down to about 30 points. <clears throat> so you still don't have a lot of the details, it's at the design stage, but they are saying, hey, I need a silencer that gets me to 60 dBA max. So now it's by design criteria, right? DBA is a rating that you use outdoors. You have 50,500 CFM. You have about one and a half inch of total external pressure that those fans can push. So all that is gonna help you do your selection. So let's look at that. I went ahead and pre-populated this just for uh, just in order to continue the presentation on time and in this case i oversized the silencer half an inch on each dimension if you remember the fan array was 89 and a half by 89 and a half but knowing how loud a generator is in the 120 decibels range uh, the engineer didn't want to add another 100 decibels with the fan and doesn't want the fans to be a problem. So the silencers are gonna serve not only for the fans, but also for the generator room, because they are going through an opening, even though the concrete walls of that mechanical room uh, is going to be 12 inch thick, they're gonna have openings, so they need to maintain a certain amount of performance. So I already know it's gonna be a really long silencer, so I'm gonna max out an elbow silencer in one piece. And I'm gonna show you why I chose an elbow silencer in the next slide. I'm gonna have these leg lengths, so the vertical leg and horizontal leg are both gonna be 117 inches, pretty large silencer. It's an inlet, right? So it's bringing air in into the room, so it's a reverse flow. Uh, I have an elbow with beams at the inlet of the silencer, so they have a water hood, uh, they are turning air in, and then there is a fan grabbing that air and bringing it into the mechanical room for uh, ventilation of those generators. And I have the sound power levels that came per octave band from that green hexometer. I am designing, I'm doing a selection by design criteria. I know that the generator room is really loud, so I'm gonna need at least 16 gauge. It's the fiberglass is fine, it has a weather hood, it's going into a generator room, and I'm gonna go and hit search. So right away, I have a bunch of options. I'm gonna select something that's under two tenths of an inch that has fairly high performance. Why? Because the engineer said, I want it to be just from the fans, no louder than 60 dBA. So this silencer that you see here gets me to 60, but nothing works as ideal conditions, right? So I'm gonna go a few points lower. I'm gonna select uh, the ERM 995D and that's going to be added into my schedule. So far, so good. All right, so from here, let's say you had those selections. You can create a submittal, you can create a schedule. And let's just quickly look at that. You did four silence, three silencer selections, four silencer selections, and you can create a schedule in a matter of minutes. This is the suggested silencer schedule where you could put your project properties, your dimensions, you're gonna have a model, you're gonna have what construction it is, low leakage, you're gonna have dynamic insertion loss, so the arithmetic deduction, the amount of sound you're taking out per octave band from the fan, but we're also gonna give you the generated noise because when you push air through any silencer or a damper or an elbow, you're gonna create noise, right? And if you recall, and this is a test for those who were in yesterday's presentation. If the sound power levels are 10 decibel uh, in, um, of difference between one another, so in the 63 hertz octave band, the fan has 90, 96 decibels. If I add 96 decibels plus 38 decibels, am I adding any noise? It's a trick question, I'm gonna check the chat. Well, answer is no. When you add 92 decibels or 96 plus 38, it's still gonna be 96. So that's just kind of using the theory from the HVAC fundamentals that Chris presented yesterday. All right, so that's how easy it is to do silencer selections. That's how easy it is to look at a schedule. 
and you could create submittals. And additional to that, you also have a bunch of resources. So when you look at the software here, you could, if you don't know how to size a silencer, you could cl click on that elbow silencer reference sheet for the sizing overview, and it will tell you how to calculate the centerline length because in the industry, elbows, what you specify for the length and what you see from any manufacturer is the centerline length, which basically is leg A plus leg B minus the width, right? And then it also shows you how to calculate it for a banked unit when it's multi-component. So a lot of the info that you'll need, uh, even a specification, for example, for noise control, if you want to hit on a silencer special if, uh, uh, specification, either for a standard or a special, so all you got to do is click on that, it's going to have you know, uh, the right section for you to add it on the mechanical section, Division 23. It's going to have all the relevant standards that pertain to silencers. And all you have to do is change potentially the gauges, right? If you have a combination of different ones, you might want to play around with this, but it is nice and easy to do, and it is up to date. There is no need to use the same specification from the 90s that is still calls and outdated version of the standard, you have everything up to date, one quick, one click away from the software. All right, so that's selection by design criteria. And just to recap that section, uh, this is kind of what I, the, that's the request, the example I was talking about. This is where the silencer was going to be. This is the supply fan array, uh, quantity of two per generator. They are using it for ventilation and then they are exhausting it through the top. I gave the engineer a solution for this, and I'm working with him to do a solution at the top, at a penthouse with a barrier wall at the top, and a bunch of silencers also for the exhaust system. So just a quick example of how powerful the software is and how easy you could provide assistance to fellow professionals in the industry. Another way to look for performance is by price model, we offer more than just the rectangular silencers. You could see there that we do circular silencers, we do polymer film or film line silencers, and packless silencers, even actual fan silencers that are meant to go with actual fans from Green Heck or from whatever manufacturer you might be using. So if we go by that, and the reason I mentioned that is if you already know the models, and you know what a CS is, which is a rectangular circular, uh, sorry, a circular silencer. You could make a selection pretty quick, 24 inch diameter, and maybe we'll do extended, call it exhaust perhaps, just do it pretty quick. Maybe we'll make it 120 inch long, maybe it's gonna be used as a stack. And circular silencers can handle in general, much higher velocities for uh, a lot of performance. So in this case, maybe let's say it's 3,000 feet per minute, which is pretty high. And inlet condition is going to, it's the exhaust, it's exhausting air, and we're concerned about the outside maybe, so we leave it as a forward flow. We'll do an abrupt plenum. Uh, we'll leave all the construction as is, but if it's gonna be exposed to the elements, you know, maybe I'll do polymer film liner and I bag it, and I also do mastic field seam, so every joint is going to be, it's going to have dock sealant to prevent any sort of gaps and water to go in. You click search, and it's saying, oh, pressure drop is too high. Well, in reality, if you think about it, for 3,000 feet per minute, you must be using a fan that can handle more than that. And, you know, those exhaust fans could typically go up to half an inch. And we have two options, right? One with the standard casing or extended casing. The extended casing adds mass to the casing. So traditionally you have four inches. So if your duct diameter is 24, you have four inches of insulation. So your duct diameter of the casing would be the 24 plus eight, or you could add extended casing, which makes the casing diameter 40 inches. But what does that do for performance? Just in general, and to keep this going pretty quick, whenever you use an extended casing for rectangular, or circular, or elbows, you're trapping that longer wave 
and allowing for more performance on the lower octave bands. And that's, as Chris mentioned yesterday's presentation, that is the hardest wavelength or frequencies to attenuate are the low frequencies, right? So in this case, we'll use an extended casing. It stares under half an inch with system effects, and we have a circular sensor that you could add into your main schedule. All right, so that is the software demo for silencer selections alone. I hope that you guys found that useful. And the last thing I want to mention before I move on, before I summarize, is you also have a bunch of documents here on the accreditation of the lab, just kind of showing that we could do the test to determine silencer performance, but also a nice explanation on why manufacturers have a different performance. Uh, let me just bring that in. And that is basically because of the standard, right? The ASTM standard for silencer, perf uh, silencer performance has a precision bias section, and typically it has some wiggle room and some manufacturers use that to, that to their advantage and massage them a little bit because you could see in some of the lower octobands they could you know boost up up to five decibels and two to three on the higher ones right so because when you do silencer testing if you think about it the size of the room to measure the correct wavelengths the instrumentation itself is different it's going to be impossible for you to get the same performance for the same silencer if you test it in the price lab versus a vibroacoustics lab. So there's gonna be a little bit of variance and that's what you have to be understanding if possible on why silencer, silencers differ in performance a bunch. All right, that being said, let's quickly move on into the rest of the presentation. In summary, you could have project properties, you could select different shapes, you could add any dimensions that you might want. When you do a silencer selection, you're gonna get insertion loss, pressure drop, generated noise, you could add system effects, you could do different materials such as galvanized, stainless steel, aluminum, you could have slip and drive connections, you could have flanges, you could have circular end caps, for example, uh, you could get uh, wide, variety of results uh, to either be conservative or cost effective. You could create submittals, you could create a schedule, and you have a resource tab with a bunch of documents that you that will help you uh, specify a silencer job. And additionally, we have a competitor's cross-reference. The, comp the competitor's cross-reference is easy to use, and let me just show it to you guys quickly. When you open all-in-one, you're gonna have a tab for the competitor's cross-reference. When you click on it, it's going to open a window for you to search either by vibroacoustics, for example. It's, uh, and if you have a schedule and you want to match and you have an RD or EXRMB, you know exactly what the model is going to be. So the RED is in elbow. So all you go is uh, click on that and it's going to bring you into the main interface to select that extended casing elbow equivalent to vibroacoustics. All right, continuing on. I think I went back one slide, I apologize. I also want to mention that it is very common and when you send these to any manufacturer, sometimes you'll notice that they give you back some crazy selections, such as transitioning on the height to the width in multiple directions, and they, they specify this crazy octopus silencer that in reality might not have tested performance. Just to give you an idea, the test standard, and for you to do test on one silencer of an average size, let's say 24 by 50 by 72 inches long, it's going to be about $8,000. If you have to test a transitioning unit with two inlets, one outlet, no one is going to have the money to test it properly as they should if they are going to specify that. So 
whether your silencer is from Price or from any other manufacturer, it's going to have extrapolated and approximated performance on a transitioning silencer. So we really recommend, if you have the option, to always question such recommendations and try to always optimize a solution such as putting a straight silencer rather than that octopus looking thing highlighted in red. Why? Because you have tested performance, you could allow for system effects and you could have the same result by using the acoustic analysis tool to predict the NC level in the space. Uh, this other silencer, for example, it transitions and they also make it an elbow that has baffles in two planes where you could potentially use an extended casing silencer or a longer straight silencer instead and it's going to be more cost effective. So just a quick side note uh, on how uh, how to place silencers and also how to size them. If your ductwork is 24 by 24, your silencer is going to be 24 by 24. I showed you how a typical silencer is scheduled looks like. We at Price like to be very transparent. We're going to give you a model. We're going to give you width by height. We're going to give you pressure drop and every piece of information you need. And here's a screenshot of the competitor's cross-reference for your information in case you want to go back and remember how to do that. You can add system effects. You could do elbows. You could do different leg lengths, right? If your vertical leg needs to be shorter than the outer leg, you could play around with that and the software is going to let you do it. Uh, if it doesn't because of design constraints, don't panic. You could send it to us or to Buckley and we could work on, uh, on that silencer that you need. It's just going to be pushed as a special. So different leg lengths can be done in the software for elbow silencers. And Finally, the resource tab. Don't forget that you have that element there in case you need any sort of documentation to back up your selections. Moving on to the acoustic analysis software demo and to recap some of the theory we learned yesterday. Acoustic analysis software is a powerful software that is being used by thousands of users now uh, in North America, Latin America, and abroad. And what it is, is an in-house software that we developed to predict sound pressure levels in the space. Some of the things you'll need to remember from yesterday's webinar is some of the terminology, such as understanding your, your acoustical environment. You're going to hear a lot of terminologies such as live. It is a live room, so a gymnasium or an operating room. Very hard surfaces, few people, nothing absorbing sound. Most of the occupied spaces, such as offices, for example, or open offices, are going to be average. So that's another term you need to remember. And it could be absorptive or medium dead. You will not see a dead environment unless it is an anechoic chamber. So it is pretty rare. Before we go and look at an example of acoustic analysis, I just want to remind you to always approach any noise control problem in such a way that you identify the source, the path, and the receiver. Uh, obviously, the source could be people, it could be mechanical equipment, it could be traffic. The path is the medium on which sound is going to travel, and the receiver is obviously, if it's an occupied space, uh, whoever is uh, going to be exposed to that noise background level. A recap on the different paths of sound for HVAC acoustics is the structure and burn path, which you could address with an acoustical curb or a noise, isolation, noise and vibration isolating curb, uh, also available at Price Industries. I'm going to show you how that might look like. Airborne path or radiated noise, right? You have a rooftop unit, but it's not just the supply and return ductburn noise uh, path which is path C, is also the radiated noise. You could have a, co a condo building close by and you have 12 units on, on, a, on the roof of a commercial building, of a mall, for, exa for example, you have 12 units running. They are radiating noise uh, outwards towards the space, in free space, outdoors toward the condominium. So that's another noise path and very important to address if it is a problem. All right, so that's a recap on the different sound paths and let's dive into acoustic analysis examples before we go into that, some of the requirements that you need. You will always need 
to know the sound power levels per octave band if you want to get an accurate prediction of a certain NC, RC, or DBA level in a space or outdoors. You need to, if you know, uh, give us a, an allowable pressure drop for a silencer. And this is how it looks like. You give us a CFM. Typically, you find this information of the from the submittal of the unit, whether, whether it is from Daikin, Aeon, Train, all of them have some power level per octave bands. And you'll see two or three pieces of information on that, the discharge, sound power level, inlet, sound power level, and sometimes, and not very many, but a few do have radiated sound power. So if you're gonna do a supply ductwork, you're gonna use the discharge sound power. If you're gonna do a return or exhaust analysis, you might be looking at the inlet sound power level. Okay, that those are the source requirements. So what's making noise? You need to know the spectrum per octave band. As for the path, you're gonna need the mechanical drawings or some info or on the distances if it's outdoors. For, but for the most part, you're gonna look at the sound path from the noise source, maybe a rooftop unit to the nearest occupied space. Um, occupied space. It could be a classroom, it could be, you name it. So that's the way any acoustician would approach it, always to the closest occupancy. We need to know dock sizes. If they are not shown in the dock work or in the mechanical room, it's gonna be very difficult to guess and do an analysis. So if you have a project that you're working on, uh, be sure to provide that information to the acoustician or have it handy for yourself. Or if you're gonna send it to Price Industries, we also do this analysis uh, free of charge in, in case you need to involve us at the design stage. Another example of how a path looks, kind of like the 2D drawing, you could also have a 3D drawing, rooftop unit, an elbow, straight duct, a junction, going into a classroom. The images you see on the left-hand side are the elements, the way they look in our acoustic analysis software. I'm gonna show you that in depth. And this is another example on how you might see another path relevant to HVAC acoustics. The receiver, it's going to kind of set your target criteria, right? Classroom is going to have a different criteria than a gym, and a meeting room is going to have a different, slightly different criteria than a classroom, right? NC30 versus NC35, for example. We're going to need dimensions of that, so width, length, and height, because we need to know the volume to perform the receiver deduction calculations. All right. So how do we like to get the information provided to us if we were to help you to do an analysis is in front of you. It would be nice if we could, um, if it could be clear that the paths are um, the supply in blue, for example, with the dimensions of the ductwork, exact airflow going through each of the branches and for the return in green. So this is just an example, if, if, if possible, if not, it's not a huge deal. It's just, it's, it is just going to extend the lead time on turning an analysis around, that's all. If you are doing an analysis, if you're gonna send this to an acoustician, this is typically the way they like to receive information. And additional to that, if you know that the ductwork is lined or not, or is heavy gauge, and if the receiver has a lot of absorptive materials or a lot of glass, or we need to know that uh, the more detailed, the more exact we can be, or you can be if you were to check and do an analysis. So let's look at example number one. In this example in front of you, and I'm gonna to try to go pretty quickly, we're looking at a supply uh, ductwork in green highlighted coming from the rooftop unit and a return silencer. But what are we gonna look on this one? We're also gonna look at the radiated noise from the bottom of the curve, right? So in this case, there is a rooftop unit right above the motors room 134 and massage room 136. All right, so what do we need? Sound power levels. Uh, we have a distance within the curve, right? I'm analyzing in this specific example, I'm gonna see how much it radiates from both outlets, or uh, that is the return and supply openings at the top of the curve from the unit. It's discharging both supply and return sound into the curb. And that curb is typically just going to have a 18 gauge liner at the bottom, right? So we're gonna simulate that. The height of the curve is gonna be two feet. 
uh, the bottom of the curve is the perimeter of the curve, which is 87 inches by, by 193. And the engineer said, those rooms have uh, ACT ceiling. The dimensions of the room is 24 by 13 feet, 10 foot high. Uh, one source, which is where you're just looking at that rooftop unit, the distance to the receiver is five feet. So they are assuming they have most of the people standing in that room. And the criterion given was NC35. Okay, so let's quickly look at that. <clears throat> I already have these paths pre-populated, but if you were to go to the home screen before you open this up, and before you're able to see all that, when you go into do an acoustic analysis, you're going to go and click launch acoustic analysis, and that's going to bring you into the software that you see in front of you. All right, so let's keep going. I already have some selections here but I want to show you how powerful and easy to use the software is when you're doing a bunch of acoustic analysis in this software. So as I mentioned, I think you all can see my screen. Yeah, thank you. We have 13,800 CFM. I have the discharge sound power levels per octave band. I have added the inlet sound power levels per octave band as well. And I have two feet of distance within the curve, but it's a line curve. It has perforated panels. So there is only one reflective surface, which is the top. And I'm simulating our acoustical panels rated at STC 55, consisting of this construction. I have my laying ceiling, suspending ceiling tile that the engineer said they had in place with the deductions for that. And I have the receiver, which is going to be a 24 by 13 feet by 10 foot tall room, five feet from the ceiling to the receiver. And in this case, not a point source, it is a rooftop unit. It's pretty long and it's about 16 feet long. So when you take those deductions into consideration and by treating the curb with price acoustical panels, which is right here, these deductions here, you can see pretty high, you can keep this space at an adequate level. If you remember, the goal was NC45, or at NC39. Now, there was way more than just the radiated noise over the top of that room, right? You have the return duckborn path going through here into the modern room space, and you also have the breakout noise of the ductwork at the top of the silencer. The, the, silencer, uh, the silencers are going to be located right at the top. So you also have breakout noise through the casing of the silencer. So you could use the software to simulate that and see what gauge your silencer needs to be. In this case, it's a 70 by 24 unit. I simulated a 10 gauge silencer. At the top of the silencer is the weakest link, right? It doesn't have baffles in the first two inches, but also in the first two feet, it's going to be louder than in the last three feet. So when you simulate that, you realize that 18 gauge silencer is not enough. 16 gauge still not enough. In this case, it needs to be 10 gauge to be able to contain the breakout noise from the supply duckborn path. All right. You have your distance, right? You have a little bit of distance between the top of the silencer and the ceiling. That's about three feet. And then you have the ACT ceiling tile, same dimensions of the room, and you are at NC40. I did the exact same thing for the return. The return did not need to be 10 gauge. Why? Because the sound power levels of the return are much lower compared to the supply. Does that make sense? And here at price are pretty transparent. We're not just trying to take advantage of you know doing the analysis. We will optimize it so that we give you the most cost effective solution. So by doing that, you have the cool ability of doing a path summation in different rooms. In this specific case, for Motors Room 134 and number 135, I have the radiated, the radiated noise through the curb path that I analyzed. I have the duckborn noise break, breakout. I have the breakout from the return silencer, the supply silencer, and also the return path going through what I mentioned, supply and return breaking out of the silencer. All right, so when you add all that and you know that your goal is 
45, uh, NC45, we are NC44, which is golden. We meet the space. But why and how did I get there? By doing a detailed analysis with a lot of detail. And if you see what's in common in all of these paths is that once one of the paths is really close to the design goal, such as NC40 and NC39, those are going to be driving noise. All right. So that's why when I did the breakout of the return silencer, I left it as 18 gauge because even if I did 24 gauge, this is still lower. But once you start adding the mop, it might become a problem and it will make you go over the NC45 total shown in the path summation. So all that can be done for all the paths, several rooftop units, as you can see in here, several, several path summations. You could add all those silencers to your file, create a schedule, and also create a detailed analysis report that will have all your assumptions. It's gonna have each path laid out and it's gonna summarize all of the rooms totals in the different spaces, in this case in the cafe, in this specific case on that 134 and 135 room that I showed you, adding all the paths relevant into the space, right? So we can be very accurate. This is what an acoustician would be doing. Uh, we can do that at price too. We recommend you still run it by a professional, but you can guarantee that we are going to be, you, you can be sure that we're going to do a good job and be accurate with the calculations based on the information provided by you. All right, so that is showing you an example of acoustic analysis software. Uh, quick and brief, I only have about seven minutes left, so I'm going to try to uh, speed up a little bit. So what what did I determine from that analysis now? And from having such a powerful software, I was able to number one, see what specific STC rating panel construction for our price acoustical panel offering, what performance they would need to treat the bottom of the curb to get that NC45 max in the space below. I also did the duckborn analysis for supply and return to cite the silencers that I recommended to be flush with the bottom of the curb. Sometimes they can go through the curb, such as this example, so that when you do the path addition, because sound, uh, you know, noise control problems are complex, it's not just one thing, you could cover everything by using the software and account for all the different portions of sound from a rooftop unit. So supply silencer, return silencer all integrated with the curb. The curb has also isolation rails to prevent any of the vibrations to travel from the roof to the occupied space below. So that is available as a special at price. I just wanted to mention that to you just so that it shows you how complex analysis can be, but the capabilities and the versatility of the software for you to perform them or for us to do them for you at no cost. You could also do outdoor analysis. These are very common. You could determine the height of a barrier. In this specific example, we're gonna do a, a barrier analysis of a small unit. And all it does is the effectiveness of the barrier wall. So it's gonna tell you based on the height, how effective that is. And based on that, it's gonna give you a certain amount of deductions, right? So just quick example here. It'll take a couple of minutes. I pre-populated that example in the analysis and as you could see on the slide in front of you we have a source that's three foot tall the distance to the wall so that the unit can perform properly is uh, six feet by the engineer the distance to the closest receiver so a sidewalk walking by for example um, is six feet the uh, distance from receiver is 14 feet actually, it's pretty far away. And the barrier height that they wanna see if it works is 10 feet. All right, so we simulated that, sound power levels, right? For that unit, radiated sound power levels, right? Because that's what's relevant on that path. Six feet from the receiver wall, the, uh, sorry, six feet from source to the wall, 14 feet from the receiver to the wall, 
the height of the source is three feet, someone standing up is assumed to be six foot tall, and the barrier height is 10 feet. Now, that's how effective the barrier is going to be. Have in mind that a barrier with an open top, whether it is four walls or three walls, can only give you a maximum deduction per octaband of 24 points. You're not gonna get more than that, right? So when that, having that in mind, when you need more than that, on a, for a, any particular reason, because the unit is too loud or the receiver is too close, then you might need to enclose the equipment fully. All right, so the distance to the receiver is 14 feet. This is being treated as a point source, and your goal was 50 dBA, you meet it. But let's say, you know, maybe there were a lot of reflective surfaces around. Like if this is between a building, right? Then you don't meet the design goal anymore. So what do you do? Well, maybe you just have to play with the height of the wall now to, to determine whether or not you're gonna meet it with a 10 foot tall wall, a 20 foot tall, and I have a feeling a 22 foot, foot tall would do it, right? So you could play around to determine how effective your barrier can be and what's the best solution for that. All right. So that is a barrier outdoor analysis. This is recapping what I mentioned that the limiting value of a barrier wall with an open top is going to be 24 decibels and you cost by scattering and the refracted element into the shadow zone formed by the barrier. So 24 points max. When you need more than that, full enclosure. And typically you're gonna get 10 to 15 points off with a barrier wall. When you have to fully enclose a piece of equipment such as a chiller, because there is a library right beside it, for example, you might have to do what I showed you, a detailed analysis for the discharge at the top, uh, intake for the compressors, and see what you might need and do a full enclosure. Now that gets complex because you need to know how much room you have, uh, you know, distance to the occupied space, so we can use the software to size the silencers, acoustical panels thickness, and we can come with full package solutions like the ones in front of you to provide a solution to the space. In this case, there was a library in one side of the building and occupied a space at the bottom. We worked with the engineer, we did the structural support, we provided access for uh, you know, maintaining the, the equipment that we were treating. Uh, this is the rough submittal on how it looked. And just to finalize this presentation, this is how it looked like in real life. We did a fully removable silencer bank at the discharge. Uh, in case they need to replace the unit, they don't need to disassemble the full enclosure. They can take the silencer of the top in one shot and take the unit from the top. This is how it looks from the residential building behind. On the right-hand side, you had a library. The next slide is showing you how we go through many iterations and provide the perfect solution to allow for access to to the item in a condensing unit that will be requiring the more maintenance which is the fan so we need to allow for someone to walk in there and potentially repair them so we allow for that we allow for a lot of space and access to some of the controls and working with a manufacturer that has the experience that we have that has a reputable lab state-of-the-art laboratory to back up performance of their silencers that has a, a one-of-a-kind software to provide acoustic analysis that has engineers such as myself and Chris and others in the team that could do site on-site measurements to confirm that the equipment is going to perform after we provide a solution is key to provide the perfect solution that is successful to keep in this picture you can see the engineer contractor, sales rep, and myself all uh, together to confirm that what we said was gonna happen, happened. Um, given the fact that we can do the structural support, provided the P review for construction on the enclosure, all that coming from one manufacturer makes it such as it is a successful project and you don't have to deal with a lot of issues on site, trying to get everything from a different manufacturer. All right, so in summary, thank you for staying a little bit late. I realized I've gone past four minutes, but I blame it on Dean because he did a five minute introduction. Uh, 
but yeah, to summarize it, we learn how to do silencer selections. We know that we have a state-of-the-art laboratory to get performance. I showed you the ability of the software to analyze independent paths, but also add them all into one space, and how that can be used to do package solutions, enclosures that integrate panels, access doors, silencers, all as a complete package. Some of the references, in case you need, just for your information, um, some of the stuff we use to come up with deductions in the software, and some other resources that you could use if you are interested related to noise control. At the bottom, you'll see our contact info for the noise control team, and I will be looking forward to working with you in many projects in the future. Don't hesitate to contact us, and thank you very much for your time. That concludes the presentation today. Thank you. All right, thanks Mauricio. Uh, I think most people are logging off now. It's past one o'clock. Um, so again, anyone that's still on, please, uh, if you didn't join us for yesterday, uh, it might be worth your time to join tomorrow and uh, forward this to anyone that you think could benefit and reach out to Buckley if you have any questions on, on uh, sound control and uh, sound evaluation. Thanks Mauricio. Thank you all, thanks Dean. Have a nice day.